So I'm excited to be able to spend this time in the Word together. But um, we, we've, we've learned a lot over the past year, and I believe that we're in this prophetic time where we are going to be challenged and have to align more and more with Yahweh's timing, with Yahweh's seasons, with Yahweh's Shabbats. And that is the time that we live in. But brethren, I have a history, and of course I've spent many years um, studying the calendar, and at, at one point I was following the, the, the lunar Shabbat and transformed and changed my life to that. And quite honestly, I was at the mercy of men and men's teaching. And it, it's, not a, it's not a good place to be. None of us want that. And I'm, I'm not here over this Sukkot to, to teach you on the calendar, on what is my opinion of what is right and what is wrong. But saying that, I do believe that we do need to align ourselves with Yahweh's calendar, and as a congregation, we should look into these things together. I don't have all the answers for sure and for certain. I don't really, really want to have the answers, because quite honestly, I want us as a body of believers to search these things out together, if we think it's important. But... Before we get into the teaching, I do want to share a lot of history of the Malkit Zedek of Yeshua and of what was going on preceding Yeshua's birth, during his lifetime, and after his death. Because I think you are going to be amazed, as I am amazed, of the similarities of what was going on with the people that loved Yahweh at that time and us at this time. In fact, we're using the very same language to describe biblical happenings as a people who followed Yeshua 2,000 years ago. The exact same terms to understand Scripture that they use, that nobody's been using before in the past thousand or so years until this generation. So I entitled this Sukkot message really is about Yeshua as our zealot king, because he is the zealot king. And it's been my experience, and I'm sure you've all heard this before because it's a, it's a catchphrase, but brethren... The past, it always has a way of returning. The past always has a way of returning. And those who don't learn from the past, brethren, and can't remember it, they're going to be doomed to repeat it. Would you agree? Yeah. And we live, in, we, we live in a world right now where people don't even know their history. They don't know the history of viral warfare. They don't know the history of borders. People just don't know the history. They're just lulled to sleep. Do you realize that the Romans, before Rome fell and the Romans, the, Ro the Roman Empire crumbled, the Romans knew that they were being invaded. But they were so entrenched in debauchery and sexual immorality that they didn't because they were a superpower. We are in a very similar place in our time and in the country that we are in exile. But this Sukkot, I want us to take time out here in the wilderness and I want to share our history with you because I believe it's our future. Our history as a people who follow Yahweh and uphold Yeshua, our history, that is our future. Would you, could you agree with that? Yeah. And many of us don't even realize it yet. Maybe some of you have an inkling. But we are going to be living the very stories that have been lived in the past. But with a different outcome. Because of the time that we actually live in. Remember at the time of Yeshua, even at the time of the writing of the Apostle Paul, Rav Shaliak Shaul, 
Many times they were wondering, is this the time? But brethren, we are further down the prophetic line of time. And everything is really pressing in on us right now. So we're going to look at the Zadokai ancestors. We're going to look at the Malki Zadoks who withstood armies. They would, well, they would stood the armies of hell themselves. We're using the same biblical language to explain our circumstances and our exit strategies as the, bi- as the biblical heroes like James, the half-brother of Yeshua, will face the same foes that they faced. We truly will, but with a different outcome. I believe in these next months, we're going to need to understand Yahweh's timing for us and more, ultimately, we're going to have to go on this Malkit Zedek journey together and see where Yahweh leads us. Because there are people that went on this journey before and it led them all the way to an amazing place where amazing miracles happened. I want to define zealotry for you, okay? We hear a lot of that with, um, we had our Torah portion, Phineas, Pincus, a few, a few weeks ago. But I have no doubt, some of you may disagree, but I have no doubt that Yeshua was a zealot king. He truly was a zealot king. He was charged with sedition. He was charged with sedition against the Roman government in Judea And it's attested to in the four Gospels. I mean, it was sedition. And when he died, he was crucified between two men. We all know this. But they were probably Jewish resistance fighters. You ever thought about that? I want to take us back to that history to paint a picture for us. Is that okay with you? Is that okay? Barabbas, Barabbas, he was to the mob what? What was Barabbas? He was a patriot. He was a patriot to the mob. He was a fighter. Whereas Yeshua, he'd advise people to do what? He'd advise people to pay tribute to Rome. So there was this struggle going on with the people. Is he the zealot king or is it Barabbas? Is it because of the war that was going on against the government, the Roman Empire at that time that was in place? Yeshua took the precaution when he went to Gethsemane and he told his disciples what? To bear arms. He said before that they went over to the Gethsemane to bear arms. So he wasn't walking in this pacifist idea that we've been taught, but he was very, very, very ready for what was coming. Yeshua had to withdraw from the people during his Galilean ministry. Why? Why did Yeshua oftentimes withdraw? Because he perceived that the people were about to take him by force. What does that mean? They were about to take him by force and proclaim him as the Zadi king. Because they were so entrenched with a battle against the Romans, against a deteriorating culture, that they were going to take him by force and make him the zealot king. Yeshua was preaching the coming of the kingdom of Yahweh. And that's what we're all concerned about. The coming of the kingdom of Yahweh. That's that's why we're all here. Because we want our life to be about the coming of the kingdom of Yahweh. But you know what? Talking about the coming kingdom of Yahweh, even today, it's like revolt, right? People look at you like, what? What? It's incitement to revolt. Against the government. Mm -hmm. Really? We've already had a little situation today. But zealot, the term zealot, it had an accepted currency at the time of Yeshua. And Canaanian, we hear that term, Canaanian 
was the original native name of which the zealots was the recognized Greek alternative. So zelotis was the recognized Greek alternative of the name that was going around in Judea at the time of Yeshua, which was Cananean. Was there a Cananean who was a close follower of Yeshua? Was there? Anybody? Yeah. Simon the Cananean? Right? Wow. Zelotis. And then we even have Judas Iscariot, which is a dreadful, dreadful, messed up translation of Caesarea, coming from the word sicker, meaning a short, cloaked dagger that the zealots hid as they went into a crowd so that they would slay someone, like the high priest they did, in a covert manner. So from Cesare we get Iscariot. So we know just from the Gospel record that Yeshua had two zealots or guerrilla fighters within his very, very close inner circle. One of them, of course, betrayed him. Simon the Cananean. I believe there were multiple guerrilla fighters within Yeshua's close group. And now some of you are getting nervous. <laughs> we're out in the woods. We're talking about guerrilla warfare. <laughs> Somebody mentioned government. Where's the Kool-Aid? We've got some lemonade over there. So no, bear with me, bear with me. <coughs> How about the title Boangarese? Does that ring a bell? Huh? Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder. James, Thank you. James and, John. James and John, the sons of Zebedee. It suggests a reputation which is attested to by their desire to do what? What was that? I mean, they, they couldn't help but resort to violence. <laughs> right? I mean, some Samaritans don't get with the program, and what do they want to do? They want to call down fire and destroy them. Right within Yeshua's close-knit group. Luke chapter 9, verse 51, we find these uncooperative Samaritans. And these guys are like, well, let's get it on. Bring down, the, let's just wipe them out, destroy them. Well, that's not very nice. The zealots were connected to a man who was reputed as being a wonder worker. The history tells us that the zealot movement was connected to a man who was a miracle wonder worker. Josephus tells us that. Josephus describes that there were signs portending divine intervention to this wonder worker, that the zealots, the guerrillas of Judea, were following this man. Because they believed that he was going to show them Yahweh's providence just as in the time of the Exodus. And do you know what those zealots called that? Providence? A greater exodus. Wow. Now, this is a term that I only heard when I went down to my first Sukkot in Oklahoma. So this is a term that was used back in the time of Yeshua by followers who were zealots of the miracle wonder worker who believed that he would show them divine signs that patterned the last exodus and they called it the greater exodus, according to Josephus. You see, brethren, this is an amazing time that we live in, because I've been reading so much history these past months in preparation, because I believe that we have to learn from back there to see exact. There's nothing new under the sun. There is nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. But the ben we are beneficiaries of something that those brethren were not. And that's where the power is at. 
The power is in Yeshua because we are beneficiaries. So how about if we were to learn what they were expecting, what they went through, but then have the power of being the beneficiaries of Yeshua's finished, accomplished, Malkitzedic work? Well, maybe that doesn't stir you. Maybe you are asleep at the wheel and you are secure in this exiled world that you live in. Maybe you're not concerned that the borders are open, that Ebola's coming in, that everything is just getting ready to destabilize. Or maybe, I mean, really, brethren, Yahweh has given us signs in the sky. But you know what? There's always going to be... There were a people that could literally go through stacked up water on either side and then two days later be moaning. Not even two days later. Well, did it really happen? Because there's people right now, oh, well, you know, they're not really blood moons. You know, it's kind of just way the atmosphere and and the light... There's always going to be... I mean, you could literally levitate before people and they would not believe. (laughs) No, seriously. So I don't know what to do with that. I can't help people like that and neither can you. You either are a people of faith or you're not. You either look at the world that you're living in and you realize it is decaying very fast and that you and I have been called out of it for something special and then you move. And that's where I'm at, and I hope that you can join me in this Sukkot. When Yeshua said, take up your cross and follow me, he was declaring a grim challenge. A grim challenge that every zealot had to face within himself. The cross was the symbol of zealot sacrifice way before it was transformed into the Christian symbol of salvation. It was the symbol of zealot sacrifice. I mean, they threw up 2,000 zealots and crucified them all along the highway to Jerusalem. 2,000 on crosses in one day. 2,000. I mean, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Let me give you some history about Yeshua. Because Yeshua was born a few years before Herod the Great. Herod the Great, excuse me, a few years before Herod the Great died. Herod the Great died in four before the Common Era. Herod's death marked the end of an epoch in Jewish history. Herod the Great's death marked the end of an epoch in Jewish history. Because since 129 before the Common Era, under the Maccabean leadership, the Seleucid rule had been thrown off. You see, the Seleucids, the Greeks, were ruling, but then the Maccabees threw off that rule. You all with me with that history so far? So the Jews were finally independent They were finally independent from foreign hands. Alexander the Great had come in and he'd sent in his general Antiochus Epiphanes. And they were under that Hellenistic Greek rule. But then that was thrown off by the Maccabeans and they were finally free from foreign rule. Even under Herod the Great. I mean... Sure, Herod wasn't like a Torah-observant Jew. He was an Idumean. He was cruel. He had total pagan tastes. But at least Herod the Great proclaimed the Jewish faith. He did proclaim the Jewish faith. And he spent a ton of money building the temple and Jewish religious shrines. A ton of money. That period of Herod the Great marked independence, Jewish independence, economic growth, and a time of peace. They weren't harassed by foreign nations. Yeshua told us, he told his followers, to flee into the mountains. Now you're getting nervous again. Flee in the mountains. 
When we see the abomination of desolation standing and making desolate. This in the Greek though was referred to as what's called Lekistros Polemos. This was guerrilla war their terminology. It meant that you had to get out of the city. It was a term where he spoke to the zealots about guerrilla warfare. Not meaning attack necessarily, but you needed to get out of the cities. He told us. He told us that we needed to have that mindset. That we needed to be a people that were thinking that way. How many of us are thinking that way? Okay. Well, this is, this is in line with what was going on at the very time of Yeshua. The term there in the Greek is lestrikos pelemos, guerrilla war or guerrilla warfare terminology. It was a time where they would have to retreat and they would regroup. And that's what we're doing. We're taking a time right now to retreat and regroup together. This was what was going on oftentimes with the followers of Yeshua during this period of time. Now Herod's kingdom, Herod's death marked an end of this state of independence. When Herod the Great died, it was the end of that independence and things shifted dramatically. We're coming up right now where there is going to be an end of a death, if you will, of the presidency, meaning Obama, has, who, who studied constitutional law so he could help you and I uphold the constitution. No. <laughs> so he could unravel it and destroy it, and then when he leaves office, a death, if you will, a whole new change is ushered in. If you can't, maybe I've been in the history books too long. I mean, it could be possible. I just can't share this strong enough with you, this Sukkot. And you have to bear with me that I'm not jumping right into the scripture, which I usually do, line upon line, precept upon precept, here or there, a little there, Calvary Chapel, the way I was trained. <laughs> But sometimes, brethren, you've got to paint a historical picture so you can bring it forward into the prophetic now. That's, you all know the scripture well enough that I hope that you can give me some time to paint this historical picture. Is that okay? Yeah. We're, in a, we're a bunch of Bible believers and we love the Word. Yeah. And the Word is superior. But we do have to put it in the context of the history and move it forward. Can you agree with that? Okay, thank you. Herod was actually, had managed to shield the Jews. Herod had managed to shield the Jews from the brute force of Roman power. I mean, the Romans were there at the time of Herod, but he managed to shield them. He was that buffer between the Romans' brute force and the community of believers. But Herod was a client prince, a total client prince. He couldn't dispose of his kingdom without Rome's consent. So now he's dead. Herod, before his death, he had nominated his son, Archelaus, to succeed him. But Archelaus and the Herodians had to travel to Rome for an imperial decision to see who was going to take over Herod's kingdom. Herod died. He nominated who was going to take his place. Now, I think about how our government works, okay, in America. Herod dies. The president is going to, in a few, it's going to finish. Somebody's going to be nominated, but they have to travel for an ultimate decision to be rendered by a higher court. Could that possibly happen in our, the way the Constitution works here in America? Because what we find at the time 
is when Archelaus and the Herodians went to travel to Rome for this imperial decision, there was open revolt. There was open revolt in Judea. The Jews were, they went, they went into warfare mode. Why? Because the Zadokite zealots, upon learning of Herod's death, and the departure of the Herodian party to Rome, they marched up from Qumran, and the zealot stronghold of Qumran, at the Feast of Yahweh, in four before the Common Era, and had an armed conflict that broke out in Jerusalem between the Zadokites and the Roman forces under Sabinus. So the Zadokites, knowing that the party had left to Rome, they came up from their desert stronghold of Qumran and they went with zealot warfare against Sabinus, the Roman forces underneath Sabinus. This is four before the Common Era. The Zadokites called on Sabinus and the remaining Herodians and the upper Sarasotial aristocracy of the Levites who were in the temple and they told the Levites to withdraw from the area the Romans to withdraw from the area the upper echelons of the Herodian society to withdraw from the area of the temple so that they could reinstate the Malkitzadot rites this all happened in four before the common era, Malkit Zadok or Zadokite rule. And revolts began to break out all over Judea, all parts of the country, until they were finally suppressed by Varus, the governor of Syria. With two legions, he came down to rescue the Roman troops. And the punishment that was inflicted upon the Zadokites and the Zealots that's when there were 2,000 of them that were crucified. This is all at the time of our Messiah, Yeshua. He was born in this atmosphere. And do you think that, like my little children, that, that, the, that the culture would affect them? Do you think that if Yeshua was born in this kind of culture, that it would have affected his worldview. Walking around, seeing burnt out buildings, 2,000 crosses with zealots nailed upon them. Would that affect your worldview? Would that affect how you communicated the word of Yahweh to people? I think it would. I think it for sure would. I mean, Yeshua's boyhood outlook it is not the pretty picture that we've been painted in a manger with some straw and a little milk bottle. I mean, and a little swaddling cloth, right? I mean, that's what we're... What was that movie? Um, it was a race car movie, and he's like, he loves baby Jesus. Baby Jesus, you know? Sweet baby Jesus, right? Yeshua was a young child when all of this happened. Yeshua grew up seeing the burnt-out buildings and hearing of the Zadokite War, which, put, which was put down by brute, brute force. No wonder that in six of the common era, common era, excuse me, Judea and Samaria were put under the hammer of Roman rule, and for the first time since Antioch, Antiochus, excuse me, when he gone in the, under the, um, in 164 before the common era, the time that we call now, what was that? Hanukkah, the Maccabees. The Jews were again now subject people. So they were subject under the Greeks. The Maccabees were that bridge that delivered them from being a subject people. They were a bridge. And now the Romans put them down by brute force because the Zadokite zealots, Malki Zadoks, the followers of the Malki, had come up from Qumran and waged war because they, de they had demanded that the Levites leave the temple and that they restore a Zadokite right. And it didn't happen. 2,000 were crucified. This is all now brings us right to the birth of Yeshua. 
Now Judea and the Jews are subject people. Brute force again. Independence gone. This is the, this is the picture that we get. Not of a little cozy manger, where everything's sweet and lovely at Christmas time, but something very, very different. Very, very different. Because we open the book of Matthew, um, we see the genealogy, and then we, we read the Gospels, those first few chapters, and what do we hear about? A census, right? There was a census. Well, now that I've painted a little bit of a historical picture, what was that census all about? To implement the imperial decision, all Zadokites, listen, to implement, it was the Zadokites that were nailed, 2,000 of them, because they'd gone up demanding the Levites leave, the general Levites leave, and they implement a Zadokai, which was an Eliezer rule, according to Ezekiel 44. And now we find a census. What, what, what could have uh, been going on at the time? It was to implement the imperial decision that all Zadokites, those who were from the tribe of Levi or Judah, the sons of Aaron, were to be called back for a census. They were Zadokites. They had to be from the tribe of Levi and Judah. They had to be sons of Aaron that were called back for a census. Why? Because they were the troublemakers. Because they were the ones that had just come back up from the stronghold in Qumran and waged war against Sabinus. They just put 2,000 of them, 2,000 of them on the cross. So now, you know what? We need to know where these people are. Didn't we just have a census? Just a few years ago? Door to door. The IRS is taking census and checking who to audit. <coughs> the sons of Aaron were called back for a census. Mary and Joseph came from, from their home at Nazareth. They weren't coming for a general Roman census that we were told. That's what I was taught. That's what you were taught. A Levite census was the reason for Joseph and Mary coming to give birth to Yeshua. To give birth to Yeshua at Ephrath in Judah's tribal center at the shepherd's field at the same place where King David was born. The reaction by the Jews to this census, of course, was very hostile. And a certain Judas of Galilee, supported by a man named Zadok, caused another revolt. They were in Babylon for 70 years, the Jewish people. But since Israel's return from Babylon, the priestly system was held up by a Zadokite rule that struggled to maintain control over a rebellious Ithamite tribal rule. That is the struggle that was going on with the priesthood. After they came back from Babylon, there was a struggle between the Ithamite line and the Eliezer line of the Levitical or Aaronic sons. The Eliezer line were the line of Zadok. The Ithamite line were the compromisers that were willing to work with the hierarchy and work with the Romans when they came in with the Herodians. They were corrupt. The Maccabeans were the bridge after the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. They were the bridge. At that point, the Eliezer line were thrown out and they had to take their scrolls because they were in the temple and they were thrown out and they went to what was called Damascus. But Damascus is a cinnamon for Qumran. So when Paul was on the way to Damascus, 
He wasn't going to Syria. He was going down to Qumran to arrest them. You see, this, brethren, is amazing stuff. Amazing stuff that we're going to be learning here. Because there was the Hellenized period from 175 before the Common Era to 159 before the Common Era. This affected the priesthood and the calendar. It was called the Seleucid the Seleucid period. 175 before the Common Era to 159 before the Common Era. This was the Hellenized or the Seleucid period with Alexander the Great. Antiochus being one of his four generals. After that period was what's called the Hasmonean period or the Hasmonean dynasty. That was from 167 before the Common Era to about 164 before the Common Era. There was no more Hellenized priests. They got rid of the Greeks, right? They got rid of the the Hellenized priests, but a new non-Zadokite Maccabean dynasty, which was at odds with the royal priesthood of Malki Zadok, was put in place. Are you tracking with me? You tracking with me? It wasn't Malkit Zadok. They were kicked out. The Zadokites were kicked out. And now you've got this Maccabean. I mean, it wasn't as bad as the Seleucid period with the Greeks. I mean, that was an abomination of desolation. So then the Maccabeans come in because the Greeks had cleaned house, right? They totally paganized it. So then the Maccabeans come in, but they're at odds with the Zadokites. Zadokites pack your scrolls and go to Damascus. So now we've got the Maccabeans here and this Hasmonean period. I mean, it's a compromise, it's a bridge. But it's not Zadokite. It's not waiting for the king of righteousness. They're down in Qumran. This, of course, the Hasmonean period. The Hellenized period now. The Hasmoneans were the bridge from the Hellenized period to what period? Anybody? The Herodian period. Okay? So the Maccabean period is the bridge from the Greeks to the Romans. It's the compromise. It's the compromise. And the righteous ones, the Zadoks, they're down in Damascus. They're down in Qumran. And they are the Zealots. They're the Zealots waiting for the wonder worker, the miracle worker. Pretty amazing stuff. The Zadokites fell into disfavor and they fled to Qumran to regroup and plan how they would tackle, in their eyes, the two corrupt priesthoods, the Maccabean and the Ithamite, known as, this is crazy, the Zadokites go to Qumran to figure out how they're going to regroup and they're going to wage war against the two corrupt priesthoods. The two corrupt priesthoods being the Maccabean and the Ithamite, known as the two moon priesthoods. They're known as the two moon priesthoods. Hence, they call their community in Arabic. What's Arabic for two moon? Qumran. Wow. It's amazing, isn't it? Wow. Amazing. Just amazing. Wow. They called their community in the Arabic Qumran, meaning two moons. It was a guerrilla refuge to fight the two moon priesthoods or the sons of darkness. Because It's all about the darkness of the moon. It's all about the darkness of the... Brethren, this movement, whatever you want to call it, has been obsessed with a dark moon. Is it a conjunction moon? Is it a sliver moon? Is it the first... There's nothing new under the sun. That is called darkness. Sons of darkness, two moon priesthoods. 
or sons of light. Now, the sign of Islam, we don't even need to go into that, right? It's pretty obvious, okay? All of this is going to culminate, brethren, over this so coat, we'll see. Because it all culminates in a war between the sons of darkness, Luna, and the sons of light that was solar. It's that simple. It's that simple. It's a war between the sons of darkness, Luna, and the sons of light, Solar. It's the feast schedule of Yahweh. That's what it's all about. Who is serving Yahweh? Are you serving Yahweh your way with your own pagan makeup? Or are you serving Yahweh his way with his feasts, his festivals, and his Shabbats? Because one is a one of desecration and the other is one of zealotry and righteousness and holiness. What do you want? It is literally a war. And it will culminate in one. It will, because there is nothing new under the sun. And the only reason I'm sharing this with you is because when you go back into your scripture, that I for sure and for certain know that you all will tonight, because that's the people that we are, you will see the paradigm of the word of Yahweh because a, con- a, a, a text out of context creates a pretext and error begets error. And you know what? We are not reading a 21st century pagan American doctrine Bible. This is a document that was written by zealots for zealots. Whether it's Phineas, whether it's Moses, whether it's Daniel, whether it's Jeremiah. And if you are fat and happy in the nations, then you know what? You are going to want to take this document and you are going to want to make it fat and happy to fit your fat and happy life. You know, it's a war, brethren. It is a war. It's amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. So I'm going to finish up now because a lot a lot of covered. But basically, brethren, there was a higher and a lower clergy. There was a higher and a lower clergy. The Jerusalem priesthood consisted of a, a, a sacerdotal aristocracy. That's a big word where the priests were divided by a higher clergy and a lower clergy. The lower clergy had had been antagonized by the upper clergy, by depriving them of their tithes, which was their only source of income. So the higher clergy deprived the lower clergy of their tithes which was their only source of income. Because the higher clergy was in cahoots with the Herodians and the Romans. And then the lower clergy, they kind of had a tendency to want to go down to Damascus on their days off. Come wrong. And then they would come back and they'd be like, yeah, 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 that's not right. So guess what they did? They cut the tides off. They cut the money off. And what would that make them? Would it make them meek? Would it make them the poor? And it, would it make them the people of the way? Because they would journey down to Qumran for support. Because they weren't getting any up in Jerusalem. They were the meek. They were the way. They were the lowly. Isn't that a term for the believers of Yeshua, right? Right? Because of this action, the lower clergy became Zadokai or zealot sympathizers. Some fled to Damascus, Qumran, and joined forces with the Zadokai zealots. James, the brother of Yeshua, had ev- heavily influenced the lower priesthood. And you can hear it in his writings. Just go and open the book of James. The epistle of James is characterized by its sympathy for the poor and its animus against the rich and the influential who were entrenched with the higher order 
of the Herodians and of the Romans. You see, brethren, we are in a time right now where Yahweh is evening the playing fields and we look at each other and we are all either with Yahweh and we are looking to the sun or we are literally starting to move back into the world. Because there is. And people will come and they draw in and then they go, ah, it's it's too much, no. I've got to go back to the world. And that is exactly what was happening at the time when Yeshua was ascending. Not ascending into the heavenlies, he had not yet done that, but he was ascending into the realm of Judea. He was drawing people to himself and it meant and it cost something. And that's what we're all here to do today. I pray is to be drawn to Yeshua, to be drawn out of the world and that ideology and to be drawn into Yeshua's feasts and festivals and his timing. But ultimately, brethren, it is going to come down to aligning ourselves with Yeshua and Yahweh's time. Well, Baruch Hashem, Yahweh. I want to recap a little bit um, of what we spoke about last night. There was a lot of information for you, kind of painting a big picture for you of the history and the time frame of Yeshua, right before his birth, during his life, and then once he had died and rose again, what was going on in Judea, what was going on with the followers of Yeshua, and the culture that Yeshua grew up in. How does that relate to us today? I believe we need to learn our past history so that, brethren, we can be prepared for the days that we live in and the prophetic future. So just a few things to recap. What we found out that after Herod the Great died, that there was an open revolt as the, has, as the Herodians went to Rome to petition to see if the descendant of Herod could take up the throne. There was an open revolt because those from two moon community, two moon in the um, Arabic is Qumran, came up, the Zadokites, those that were waiting for the Malki Zadok, the king of righteousness, came up to take over the temple and the priesthood because they were tired of the corruption, they were tired of the Ithamite Levites being in cahoots with the Romans, being in the cahoots with the Herodians, and they wanted to take back the royal priesthood and implement that in Jerusalem. But they were squashed. Yeshua grew up in this culture. He grew up seeing the burnt out buildings. He grew up amongst a community where there was zealotism down in Qumran, known as Damascus in the ancient writings. And he would have, was very familiar with this. We know now that the census, the census that appears in the Gospels, it wasn't just a general Roman census. This was a census for the sons of Aaron, those of the tribe of Judah and those of the tribe of Levi, those that were involved in the uprising. The Romans wanted to census in particular the sons of Aaron, because they had just been involved in an open revolt. 2,000 of them were crucified on the way to Jerusalem, and the Romans needed to know where these Aaronic sons, these Eliezer, Zadokite line of priests were in Judea. They knew that they were in the two moon community, Qumran, but that was a stronghold. That was a guerrilla stronghold. They weren't going to go down there. But there was also a dispersion amongst the rest of the Jews in Judea and Galilee. And that was what that census is that we see the parents of Yeshua going to. It wasn't just a general Roman census of everybody in Judea, but it was specifically for the sons of Aaron of the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Judah, the Eliezer line that we know is Zadokite. The Romans wanted to know where these guys were, where their families were, so that they could quash 
any squash, any future revolts. That makes sense. That's kind of what we were looking at last night. Then we went back and had a review, a quick review of the history, because we know, going back a few hundred years now, Alexander the Great had sent in his one of his generals, Antiochus Epiphanes, into Jerusalem, and that was right then when the Jews were taken, the temple was cleansed, the Zadokites that were in place at that time, according to Ezekiel 44, they were thrown out and they were then taken out at that point. That was known as the Hellenized period. There was the Hasmonean period after that, which was a Maccabean Hasmonean period, which was a bridge. At that point, there was no Zadokites. They were down in the two moon community in Qumran. And the Hasmonean or the Maccabean period was the bridge from the Hellenized period of Antiochus Epiphanes to the Herodian period. The Maccabean period was the bridge. But it, it was a corrupt priesthood, just as the Herodian period was a corrupt priesthood. So now what we see is there was a higher and lower clergy in Jerusalem in the temple. The higher clergy being general Levites or Ithamite Levites that were working with the Herodians. They were into the power structure and the Herodians were working with the Romans. That was the higher clergy. Now the lower clergy, the higher clergy wanted to keep the lower clergy in subjection, so they withheld the tithes. The lower clergy became known as the poor. They weren't getting any funding. The meek and the lowly. And they would go on the way down to the two moon community, Qumran, because they began to become sympathetic with the zealot movement down there, which was the Zadokites, awaiting the great deliverer, the Malki Zadok. So the lower clergy started to become very, very familiar with those in Qumran and started to become affected by those teachings too and would try and bring it and re-influence the higher clergy. But there was this opposition going on. And it ultimately came down to a war between the sons of darkness, those that were awaiting the lunar times, and the sons of light, those that were in the what's known as the Enoch or the solar, in the ways that they would calculate the times. It was a war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. So that brings me now, because somebody asked last night, where do you get this information from? I've got a huge resource library that many of you um, may know about. You can go to the Torah to the Tribes website, you can click on About, and you can see um, a little bit of a, a profile about me, but then underneath there's a bunch of resources of where I get this information from. So you're welcome to have a look at that in your own time. <coughs> But Josephus, of course, is a huge resource. It's a very muddy water of history to get through. Because he was a traitor, he was a turncoat, and he liked to uh, tell history that made himself look good. But it wasn't necessarily true, but it was all about making him look good. But ultimately, he was a Jew that betrayed his people and went to the Romans and actually became a Roman, in essence. So, you know, not a very good testimony and quite a hypocrite. So there's a, you have to read a tremendous amount just to get a few tidbits. So it's a, it's a muddy water, but you know what? That, that is a great resource for the history of the first century, the time of Yeshua. So let's talk a little bit about Josephus, because I think that's important if I'm bringing forward some information that we know about this fellow. Can you agree with me on that? Okay, so his name was Titus Flavius Josephus. That's what he ended up being called. Titus 
Flavius Josephus. Doesn't sound very Jewish, does it? Okay, so that's quite telling in itself. But he was born Yosef ben Matiyahu, wow. Joseph, son of Matthew. Wow. Yosef ben Matiyahu, the first century Romano Jewish scholar and historian. He was born in, Jer- in Jerusalem. Listen to this. He was born to a father of priestly descent and a mother who claimed royal ancestry. Okay, because this is very, very telling. Because I've been explaining to you how the higher clergy were at war with the Zadokites in Qumran, that the lower clergy were becoming sympathetic, and what pushed the lower clergy to actually join with the Zadokites and ultimately stop the temple sacrifices was because... The tithe was withheld from them and they became the poor, the meek, the lowly. A term that is used to describe the followers of Yeshua. You see, this is all going to tie in for where we are and who we are as a people. So, Josephus, he initially fought against the Romans during the first Jewish war as head of the Jewish forces in Galilee until he surrendered to the Romans in 67 of the Common Era. And his, um, the Roman forces at that time were being led by Vespian. And after six weeks, there was a siege at Jopiter where Josephus... This is dreadful. Josephus convinced everybody to commit suicide. Everybody, men, women, and children, and then he switched sides. That's Josephus. So, of course, the turncoat, you know, that's a relatively modern term, but it really does apply to this man. A dreadful, dreadful traitor. So, Josephus was actually, brethren, a priest of darkness. He was the priest of darkness that is actually spoken about in the Qumran text. And Yeshua is the priest of, the high priest of light, which is spoken of in the text. There is a war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. And it all is connected, just like the prophetic word, into Diana, Luna, and ultimately the solar. And just like in our Torah Parsha, Balaam, we see that there's two vineyards. Two broad roads, brethren. Yet, you've got to be on the donkey. And you've got to be on the narrow road that leads to life. You've got to get out of the two vineyards. You know, if you want to go and join Islam, and you want to be a part of that, and all of the various sects, that that is accepted. It's even accepted in the world today, more and more and more and more so. That is Luna, Luna, Luna. That's totally okay. That's acceptable in the world that we live in. But also on the other broad road is solar, paganism. It has influenced the world that we live in. Typical Christianity that many of us have come out of. It's all solar, solar, paganism, paganism, paganism. And that's another broad road. And even if you're an unbeliever, you've never been to church, you live in a solar realm. A solar realm of paganism. People at my work will be telling me, you know, we're coming up on the month of December, can we decorate? Because why? Because that's the solar pagan world that we live in. But the narrow road that leads to life, brethren, is that you come out of both of those realms and you're on this narrow road that leads to life, which is truly discerning the things of Yahweh, using the solar realm in a biblical manner, not a corrupted manner, and following the sun, S-O-N, the great Malkitzedek. So, brethren, as we go on more, we're going to see that the Dead Sea Scrolls actually describes a war 
between the priests of light and the priests of darkness. Is it possible that we could be the recipients of such a time and such a war in our life? I mean, we even have the term now ISIS, which is connected to Luna. <coughs> you see, brethren, these terms are not just a coincidence. Maybe to you that are half asleep and just totally want to get back into the world. But to us that are trying to come out of that system, our eyes are wide open. Wide open to see that there are signs everywhere if you can see it. And if you have an ear to hear. But ultimately it takes what? What does it take? It takes faith. Do you have the faith? Do you have the faith? So Josephus, going back to Josephus, Josephus' father was Jehorib, who was made the first of the 24 priestly divisions. Josephus' father was the first of one of the 24 priestly divisions organized by King David. His name doesn't appear, however, in the list of the Zadokite dynasty that's in 1 Chronicles chapter 5 and 1 Chronicles chapter 6. Josephus uses an account of Judas and Zadok to tell of all of the evils of the Zadokite zealot movement. Because, of course, Josephus was against that movement. Because that movement was the sons of light that were trying to take over the corrupt priesthood of which Josephus was at one point, before he went totally Roman, a great part entrenched with. We can already see from his character that he was a compromiser. Okay? And ultimately, by his end, the ultimate traitor and the ultimate turncoat. But even when he was operating within the priest, he was a priest of darkness. A priest of darkness. He would tell of the evils of the Zadokite zealot movement, which he recorded as having stemmed from various men. These men were known as the Cesari, or as what we would call in our modern King Jimmy, the Iscariots. Judas the Iscariot, Judas the one who carried the sicker, the short zealot sword used for clandestine, clandestine murder of compromised priests. You know, the Iscariots, the Cesari, they did murder the high priest. These things were going on during the time of Yeshua. And these men were the disciples of Yeshua. The Cananean, which means a guerrilla warfare fighter and a Cesari. Judas the Cesari. They were all part of Yeshua's close, close disciples. Because Yeshua was a leader of a movement of the sons of light that were all about taking over the corrupt, the corrupt temple system. The zealots, Josephus called them the Cesari, the zealots, the Zadokites. He called them brigands, which according to him, they were the very cause for the destruction of the temple in 70 of the Common Era. According to Josephus, they caused the destruction of the temple in 70 of the Common Era. You see, towards the end, about 67 of the Common Era, the Zadokite line, there was a leader of the Zadokite line, a leader of the Cesari, a descendant of Judas, because Judas, way back in 6 of the Common Era, he was the one that had led the open revolt against the Romans when they nailed 2,000 of the zealots to, to crosses on the road to Jerusalem. You see, what you actually see is this descendant line. What happened after Yeshua raised from the dead? Who was made in charge? Just some old guy, or was it the half-brother of Yeshua. You see, there was a line of succession in the zealot movement, just as there was in the corrupt priesthood movement. It's always a line of family succession. 
So the Sasari killed their victims, like I said, in public by stabbing them with short daggers. The Latin, Cesarius, one who murders with the sicker. That's what it means in Latin. Or a dagger. And they would conceal those within their cloaks. And the first one that they killed was the high priest, Jonathan. Why did they kill the high priest, Jonathan? Because he was corrupt. He was a priest of darkness. Amongst um, Yeshua's disciples, we have Judas Cesari. That was his real name. Judas, it wasn't his last name. It was what he did. Judas the Cesari, the assassin. He was the assassin. Mistranslated, of course, as Iscariot. Simon the Zealot, or Simon the Cananean. Or Zelotis, Zelotis, the Zealot. Cananean being the original native name of which Zelotis was that Greek alternative. Yeshua told his followers, you and I, like I said last night, that ultimately you've got to flee to the mountains when you see the abomination of desolation. That was a guerrilla warfare term. Retreat, regroup, reorganize, go back and take the priesthood. Desert caves, when the abomination would stand in the temple. Qumran became that place of the Zadokites, the Zealots, and the Sisari movement, where they would take back the priesthood from the Jewish collaborators, of course. The greatest Jewish collaborator of all is the character of our drama, Josephus. The greatest Jewish collaborator of all. The Romans, they, he collaborated with the Romans and the government of Herod Antipas in Galilee. So the Zealot movement was founded when Yeshua was a young boy. Just a young boy. Most probably when he was about 12 years old. Those silent years. That's exactly when this movement was really taking strong roots because of what had happened. From the stronghold of Qumran, they conducted in the Greek, Lestrikos Polemos, guerrilla warfare. This has all been hidden from us, because we want baby Jesus in the manger. But, but, but that really, really isn't what this is about, this life that we have. It's, it's, it's not that easy. Not if you're truly pressing in to Yahweh. I mean, it can, it can be a broad, easy road if you just want to, you know, make it kind of a religious trip to make yourself feel good about things. But if you want to change your life, that means that you give up things in your life that you know aren't right, things that hold you back, sins, strongholds, those things that just keep you carnal. If you want to make those changes in your life, then that's called being a disciple. That means, you know, you're going to go over in the woods over there or over in the woods over there, that you're truly a zealot for Yahweh. And I pray that we all are, and if you're not, that you would turn into one. Because that's the only way to overcome this disgusting thing called the flesh. But you've got to be a zealot. You have got to want to kill the sin that is within you. Not just get your pen knife out and kind of mess around with it and nick it. And then put your pen knife back and go, man, I'm still struggling with these sins in my life. And I, I don't know why I keep going. Because you don't hate the sin in your life. You just feel guilty because, you know, it kind of caused a blow up in your family or, you know, your co-workers. But really, you don't hate the sin in you. It's kind of your friend. It's kind of your go-to place when things get tough. That's not the life of a disciple. You've got to hate sin, slaughter sin, so that you can be relieved of that sin. That is zealotry, brethren. And that's what Yahweh is calling all of us to do. <laughs> and it's not an easy life. It's not. It's a life, brethren, where you need community. You need the support of real brethren that are like, yeah, this isn't a facade. This is real. I have real struggles and I am really trying to overcome and become that unleavened lump. Because we've only got one life. That's what they were doing in Qumran. That's why there were so many mikvah pools. Because how many of you feel like waking up every morning and go, I need another mikvah? I mean, I know I did. 
Right? Daily mikvah. Let's talk about Masada. Who's been to Masada? Who rode the cable car up there? Who took the stairs? <laughs> it was the last stand. It was the last stand of the Iscariot or the Sisari sect. It was the last stand of the Iscariot or the Sisari sect. One who murdered with a sicker or dagger. Josephus records that their leader was a Zadokite called Eliezer. Eliezer, of course, the son of Aaron from the Zadokite line. The war was between the other sons of Aaron, the Ithamite line that had been basically fired. Basically fired. Right? That's the war, brethren. That's the war. In fact, I should read it to you. It's very interesting. Turn with me to Marseh Shlechin, the Acts of the Apostles. These things, we, we read over it so many times because it's just a, little, just a little hint of something deeper there. Um, we, but we're, we're usually studying um, maybe a, a particular doctrine or something we're trying to understand. And we'll, 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 we'll read through this. But instead of, of reading the whole chapter, I'm going to actually hone in and see if you catch it because behind just two characters here is a whole sea of information. Acts chapter 5, verse 33. Now, of course, to set the context here, the Shlechim, the apostles, are on trial again. Yet again, they're on trial. They've been teaching in the temple. They're causing a ruckus. There's a tremendous amount of people that are interested in the message of these zealots, these Zadokites. Shall we kill them? What are we going to do with these guys? Let's kill them. Let's stone them. And then all of a sudden, this famous character stands up. His name's Gamliel, and he's like, hang on a minute. Let me share some history with you. And this is what is said in chapter 5, verse 33. And when they heard this, they were furious and they plotted to kill the apostles. Then one of the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamliel, a teacher of the Torah, held in respect by the people. And he commanded them to put the apostles, the Shlechim, outside for a little while. And he said to the men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thaddeus rose up claiming to be somebody. So who's that? Well, what's that all about? A number of men, about 400, joined him. And he was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and it came to nothing. Nothing. But there's more. After this, Judas, Judas of Galilee, he rose up in the days of when? What did I just uh, tell you? And we just skipped over it, right? Yes, that Judas. He rose up in the day of the census. And he drew away many people after him. And he also perished. And all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan is a work of men, it's not going to come to anything. But if this is from Yahweh, you do not want to stand against it. So what was going on with the, ep uh, with the episode of Thaddeus? None other, brethren, than a preparation for the greater exodus. And that was the very term that was used by Thaddeus. Because he was reading the same scriptures as you and I. He was seeing what was going on with the government. 
He was seeing what was going on with the religious community. He could see how everything was becoming so wishy-washy, to use a modern term, so corrupted, so pathetically lacking in power. And many of you are here because you truly, truly love Yahweh. And you truly, truly have had a salvation experience and circumcision of the heart. And you're not here because you just wanted to eat up an hour on a Sunday morning and sing a few songs and listen to a 25-minute sermon. You said, I-, I want more. And if he's truly, truly in me, which I know he is, he said I would never hunger and I would never thirst. Then why is this just, just wimpy stuff? that I am hungry and thirsty. I need more. I want to dedicate my life and I want instruction that is concrete, tangible, that I can grasp hold of, that is going to show me to lead the way. That is called Yahweh's teaching and instruction. That's where we're all at, brethren. We're trying to rightly divide it, but that's where we're all at. Well, this same movement, we can see now Thaddeus is spoken of by Rabbi Gamliel in Acts 5.36. Because Thaddeus, this character, was heralded as a wonder worker, a wonder-working prophet who understood the prophecies that we read in Jeremiah, the prophecies that we read in the Torah, and the context of the understanding of where we live. He was living in a time so similar to us so similar to us. And he understood it to be the preparation, the laying the foundation for what he called, Josephus records, the greater exodus. That's a term that you and I have picked up in the past decade. I never heard of it in the church, never heard a sermon about it. It hasn't been spoken of for thousands of years. But Thaddeus used that term. His timing was wrong. There, his end was not good. Somebody else spoke to me this morning, Ken. What did you say, Ken, about sharing with your friends about, what did you say about Qumran and they told you? Speak loud. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we, we just mentioned Ran and Julie just shared that we're looking for a Qumran this is about a month ago and they looked at us and they're more observant people. They said, said, you realize they all died, right? We're like, Could you pass the, the Kool-Aid? Bring it out. <laughs> we got it somewhere back there yonder in bushes. No, but the purpose is, well, he's not called us to a comfortable life. He's called us to what? A life of living on the narrow road. It's not about what we have, but about our end, which is ultimately about being with him. And it's striving for that life of perfection which can only come in Yeshua. But Thaddeus, he was one who understood the greater Exodus prophecies of Jeremiah, just like us. His timing was wrong, of course. But Thaddeus persuaded a considerable (coughs) body of believers to follow him out of Jerusalem with their belongings to the Jordan River. Why do you think that he was going to go to the Jordan River? What would he have been expecting at the Jordan River if he was expecting a greater exodus? Had the Jordan River ever parted before and they walked through on dry ground? For sure and for certain, he said, come on, we will go off into the desert after Yahweh provides another greater exodus for us. And he sends and he gathers together over 400 men. They leave to Jerusalem. They follow Thaddeus down to the River Jordan, awaiting for the Jordan River to part so that they can go through on dry land. He promised that he would be able to divide it and provide easy passage to the desert stronghold beyond. Now, the procrator up there in Jerusalem wary of another zealot uprising, dispatched a force of cavalry to stem this prophetic tide. 
Thaddeus was captured, he was beheaded, as were many of the brethren who got caught up in the prophecy, but the greater exodus had been proclaimed and the sound of that went out amongst those in Qumran. Now let's talk about another infamous character, Pilate. How does this affect us today? Brethren, like I said, I read all this stuff and there is nothing new under the sun. Because now I'm going to show you that there is a connection between Pilate's end and the Ron Wyatt, Michael Rood connection. I don't know if any of you have heard about that over the years. <coughs> Who here knows about Ron Wyatt? Show of hands. Okay, he died. But he proclaimed that he had found certain holy vessels and that there was an earthquake crack and there was a, a blood stain on it. And, it, and, and all of it, you can read all about it and... And Michael Rood jumped on that and came out with many, many teachings. So there are a lot of brethren, truly, that are in full expectation of some time, what? The revealing of certain holy vessels that have been hidden, but they're going to be revealed, and guess what we're going to do then? And we're all going to go and look for those holy, they're out here in the desert. Right? Because Pilate's end, his career was terminated when he took action against the Samaritans. This is the end of Pilate. Pilate's career was terminated when he took action against the Samaritans who had been persuaded by a pseudo-prophet that the sacred vessels believed to be hidden by Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, were about to be revealed. And all of the Samaritans gathered together ready to ascend Mount Gerizim because they were going to find these holy vessels of this pseudo-prophet that said, hey, look, they're over here. Do we live in a world where that is going on today? And do we have people like lemmings? Oh, really? We do. Is it possible, brethren, that history could repeat itself and a bunch of people would literally buy plane tickets, fly over and follow the words of pseudo-prophets? Let's see how it ended for Pilate. So the Samaritans, they all gathered together at the bottom of Mount Gerizim, armed, ready to go and find at the leading, under the leadership of the pseudo-prophet, these sacred vessels. They came heavily armed to witness the miracle. But when, under Pilate's rule, he sent a garrison of Roman troops down to quell any sign of revolt. And I believe, brethren, that we'll see something like this in our prophetic future. There'll be a group of gullible messianics following this type of thing because of what is being circulated around on the internet today. Ungrounded, and again, not knowing the history, repeating it in the future. But what happened? I mean... These discoveries, these so-called discoveries of Ron Wyatt in the 1990s, I mean, brethren, you've got to be careful, otherwise you'll be like sheep led to the slaughter. Now what happened is Pilate came down so strong and so heavy on those Samaritans and slaughtered a bunch of them that he actually got recalled and the governor of Syria came down and that was it, that was the end for Pilate because he squashed it in such brutality such brutality. We need to be extremely discerning of what we get caught up in. And we need to be extremely discerning of what the scriptures say, but we have to learn from our history. Because brethren, I believe that we live in some amazing, amazing times. My faith gets stronger and stronger and stronger each and every day, even though there are many pressing things. 
pressing things, battles of the flesh that come upon us all. But you continue to press in. It's amazing how Yahweh carries us more and more. I think I've shared enough this morning just on that history because when we meet this evening, I want to go in and explain a little bit more, which I think is going to be extremely exciting. Remember, I spoke about the census and the Romans called a census of who? The sons of Aaron. How come Mary and Joseph had to go to that census if it was just for the sons of Aaron? Are you saying that Yeshua was a son of... We'll see you at 6.30 tonight. <laughs> <laughs>